still be going now. Good afternoon and welcome to the noon meeting of the Rotary Club of Baton Rouge. Uh, today, uh, before we start, please remember to silence or turn off your cell phones so they don't interfere with our speaker and our program. The invocation will be given to us by Trip Horthon. After the invocation, please stay standing for the pledge, which will be led by Sarah Downing. And then after the pledge, the four-way test, which will be led by Paul Moran. Please pray with me. Creator and sustainer of all that is or will ever be, accept our thanks for this day and all its blessings. <clears throat> we pray for peace and goodwill among people across the world. We pray for an end to sickness, disease, and poverty in our families, in our community, and across the world. Give us courage and determination as we work for health, peace and prosperity for all. We ask that you guide and direct our club, its leaders, and our actions. Grant that each of us may discern and discharge our responsibility to you, to Rotary, to our community, to our country, and to our world. Bless our fellowship today and bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. In your service, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me in the uh, four-way test. Of, of the, the things, things that we think, think say, say or do, do. Is, is it the truth? truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And now John Grubb will introduce today's guests. Please join me in welcoming our guests today. As I introduce you, uh, please ask if you please stand if you are able and remain standing until everyone has been recognized and hold your applause. Kelly Welch, guest of Stephanie Cargill. Bob Banthe, also a guest of Stephanie, and Chandra Stacy. 
Kathy Falls and Jordan Jopling, who are guests of Chris D'Elia, Creston Willis, who is a guest of John Godby, and Mike Wall, guest of Pam Wall. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the club. Today's head table, to my right, your left, Sarah Downing, partner, TWRU CPAs and financial advisors who led us in the pledge, Stephen Winkler, past president, vice president of Physician Practice Management Women's Hospital, Philip Smith, vice chancellor of Institutional Advancement, Baton Rouge Community College, Paul Moran, account executive, Castling, who led us in the four-way test. I'm your club president, Maui Tachi. Mark Benfield, our speaker, who will be more formally introduced. Chris Delia, dean and professor, LSU College of the Coast and Environment. And Trip Horthorn, partner, Keen Miller LLP, your head table. We have a couple of announcements. As we've stated, August is membership month. And so if you submit an application during the month of August, you will be eligible to win a $200 gift certificate to Ruth Chris. To qualify, a new member must, uh, application must be turned in by August 31st. Uh, and please send the PowerPoint to Sherry. And then uh, I want to show you a, uh, a quick PowerPoint. And uh, past president Stephen Winkler is going to come up and speak a couple of minutes about uh, membership. I know you're all familiar with the two-minute elevator conversation, right? That's really what this is all about, because you only have usually about two minutes when you get an opportunity to speak to somebody about potential membership in the club. So what is it that's about this club that you want to be, or your friend, or your colleague, your coworker, maybe even your competitor, wants to be in this club? What's great about our club? Our members. You guys are fabulous. What's great about our club? Our speakers. We've got one again today. River of Plastics. Last week you heard from the future governor. <laughs> yeah, y'all laugh. <laughs> Can you watch, watch what's going to happen. What's, what's good about the, where we meet? We're centrally located right here. And, oh, not to mention the food. I know you're all enjoying the food. What's great about our club? All of our projects. From the food bank, Mike is right here to make sure that everybody signs up for a volunteer time. Uh, Habitat for Humanity, our international events that we also work on in the water projects. And so what, is, what, do, we wanna, what do you want to have sort of in that two-minute talk about the, about the club? Prospective members, make a list of your folks that you know that would be fantastic or would enjoy this club. Because you enjoy it, you wouldn't be sitting here today. So let's bring some of your friends and relatives in, and neighbors, spouses maybe. So, to, so take Rotary wherever you go, wherever you are, whatever meeting you're in, be thinking in the back of your mind about Rotary. Attendance is not mandatory. People still think that attendance is mandatory. Yes, we keep track of it, but it's not mandatory. So don't give up. They first tell you, no, come back to them next week. Come back to them next month. Put it on your list. Get them again. Think about diversity. You know, so often we just we invite people who look and feel just like us. We don't need to do that. We need to broaden our perspective and look beyond that. So think about diversity and invite them to lunch. As a prospective member, you don't get billed for it. The club picks it up. Right, Sherry? Yeah. <laughs> that's what it's all about. Is that the last of the Okay, that's it. So look under your chair now. No, no, don't do that. That was, my, that was my old days. Thank you all very much. Do consider it, though, and our, our guests that are with us today. You're going to see a great program. Think about it. We'd love to have you join us. Thank you very much. Now it's back to you. I want to thank Stephen and the membership committee for doing a, uh, a really good job. And, uh, and Stephen's going to pick up lunch, so if you mind, you remember. <laughs> So, 
COVID vaccination uh, next week uh, is going to be the second dose of the vaccinations that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago that will be on September 1st between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. It could be your first or second vaccination. It's open to anyone, not just members of the club. So if you know anyone who you needs a COVID vaccination, please invite them. And uh, again, uh, much thanks to uh, Tim Young and the Open Health Clinic for putting this on. And uh, thank you for our members for spreading the word. Next Wednesday, also, our speaker is going to be the Louisiana State Treasurer, John Schroeder. And he's going to be speaking to us in an update from the State Treasurer's Office. And then on September 8th, we're going to have Coach Kim Mulkey previewing the LSU women's basketball season. Mark, thank you for speaking to us. Every week, the Rotary Club Foundation donates a book to Crestworth Elementary School on behalf of our speaker. And today's book is Dog Diaries, Curse of the Mystery Mutt by James Patterson. And before uh, Chris Delia comes up to introduce our speaker, please remember, keep your mask on when you're not actively eating or drinking uh, so we can continue to enjoy Rotary safely. And now Chris Delia will introduce our speaker. You know, just comment, I see my regular table is pretty full right now, so Haggai, make sure none of them leave early. They always right in the back, get out early. Uh, today's speaker, Mark Benfield, is a professor in the Department of Oceanography and Coastal Sciences in the College of the Coast and Environment at LSU. He's been there since 1996. Uh, Born in South Africa, he emigrated to Canada and then to the U.S. He tells me that he's held passports in all three countries, which probably qualifies him as the most international member of our very international faculty. Mark received his Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto, his Master of Science from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and PhD from Texas A&M University. He did his postdoctoral work at the biology department in, uh, at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, where he continues to hold an adjunct appointment. Mark's fascinating research is focused on zooplankton ecology, deep sea ecology, optical and acoustic sensing of zooplankton, computer-based classification of zooplankton, acoustic telemetry studies of fish and invertebrates, and application of industrial remotely operated vehicles, ROVs, in biological observatories. More recently, he's turned his attention to the emerging problem that he will discuss today, plastic pollution in the aquatic environment. You may have learned about Mark's research in the past. As part of the Serpent Project, which is an industrial academic partnership involving the oil and gas industry uh, using ROVs, he and his colleagues made five observations of giant swimming oarfish in the northern Gulf of Mexico. These observations include the deepest verified record ever made of this magnificent creature, and the observation was widely reported by the media. Oarfish are fascinating because of their large size, which may ex exceed 35 feet. But oarfish are for another rotary talk. You will learn a lot today about a very different and important topic from Mark's uh, presentation today. So, Mark, it's all yours. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mawe, and thank you all for inviting me. I hear everyone leaves at 1 o'clock, so I've got my clock here so that we have time for some questions. Well, I think everyone here has noticed that we have a trash problem in our city. And if you travel to other cities, we have trash problems there, too. Uh, that's a picture in Tom, on Thomas Delpit Drive. But you can find scenes like that throughout our city and the surrounding parish. And all of this trash, which is largely plastic, is really only one or two rainfalls away from making its way into our waterways and into the Gulf of Mexico. You can see it in the booms that the city has across the Corporation Canal uh, at the beginning of Bayou du Plantier. And this stuff gets retained. It doesn't get picked up very frequently. And the next rainfall just moves it on down until it makes its way to the Gulf of Mexico. In 2015, I took a group of students out into the Gulf of Mexico for a 24-hour classroom research cruise. And during that time, we took a look 
at microplastics in the area. Nobody had looked for microplastics in the Gulf of Mexico. I'll talk more about what they are in a second. But when we hauled in our nets, we could immediately see large concentrations of microplastic. And if you've been to the beaches along the Louisiana coast, down to Elmer's Island or a place like that, Grand Isle, you can see micro and macro plastic in abundance. So microplastics are plastics about the size of a Mardi Gras bead, five millimeters or less. That's the operational definition of a microplastic. And here you can see some micro beads. We collected these from the Mississippi River. They're on the face of a penny. Uh, so these are, they can be extremely small and they can continue on down to the size where you really need a microscope or even an electron microscope to see them. Plastics, or microplastics originate from a number of sources. The first is fragmentation of macroplastics. So when plastic is exposed to sunlight, the plasticizers in the plastic, which are the compounds that give it its texture, its ductility, uh, its flexibility, they start to break down under ultraviolet light. And this makes the plastic brittle. And so then the plastic is, is vulnerable to mechanical fragmentation when it's tumbled around, when a car goes over it, when you run your lawnmower over it. And any piece of large plastic starts a process when it gets into the environment of continual fragmentation and it moves down into micro and then really, really small microplastic fragments. Another source is bead blasting, much like sand blasting. You can go to Lowe's, you can buy a five gallon bucket of plastic uh, pellets and these can be sprayed to remove corrosion. They're often used in the marine industry and of course they're spraying it into water bodies. Raw plastic resin pellets or nurdles, uh, they've been in the news a lot lately. These are the precursors for plastics, so these are pure polystyrene or polyethylene, uh, and these are what are melted down, added to plasticizers, colorants, and put into injection molds and out pops, you know, cell phone case or something like that. Whenever nurdles are handled and transshipped, they are spilled. Tires are largely made of plastic. There's rubber in them, but there's also a lot of polymer, so when you lay a patch of rubber, you're really laying a patch of plastic. And so the tire fragments, as your tires wear down, uh, get on the roads and then get washed into our drains and into our waterways. A big one is laundering of synthetic uh, garments. So a lot of our uh, fabrics now are made of uh, polyethylene terephthalate or nylon. And so the lint that you pull out of your dryer, an even larger quantity of lint goes out with the rinse cycle. And so these tiny fragments, which pass through most screens, and uh, systems designed to prevent plastic from getting into our waterways, they pass through and they get into our waterways. Uh, a lot of personal care products in the US used to have uh, abrasive plastic beads in them, um, things like that Neutrogena face scrub. In 2018, they were outlawed, but they can still be present in prescription products and they can still be found in products that are old or products that uh, are sold outside of the United States. And then finally, paint. Paints are largely uh, made of plastics now, and so paint flakes are plastic flakes. So these are the main sources of microplastics. And when you look at a microplastic, so this is a picture I took in a microscope in my lab. It probably was a styrofoam cup, part of a styrofoam cup at one point, but now it's just a millimeter or so across. You can see that there's a lot of surface area relative to the size of this object, and lots of nooks and crannies. And so that surface area combined with the hydrophobic nature of plastics, if you put water on plastic, it beads up. That's because it's hydrophobic, it repels water. Well, hydrophobic compounds are very attractive to organic molecules, and to organic molecules like herbicides, pesticides, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, DDT, things like that. They will stick to the surface of these plastics. And so over time, that little piece of styrofoam will build up a load of organic pollutants on the surface and in all the nooks and crannies on its surface. And so these plastics are acting as like a little Uber and they're transporting all these nasty <laughs> compounds with them down into our oceans and uh, into our rivers and our oceans. So why would a fish eat something that's covered with all that nasty gunk? Well, there's something interesting that happens to these plastics over time. So when a piece of plastic enters the water, over a process of about two months, it, the surface of that plastic 
gets colonized by microbes. And those microbes produce a compound called dimethyl sulfide. Dimethyl sulfide, or DMS, you've all smelt it. It's the smell of the sea. It's that salty smell. It's naturally produced by marine phytoplankton. Seabirds use the smell of DMS to locate patches of phytoplankton where they can likely forage for small fish like anchovies. And so it doesn't take long for this little piece of plastic to start to smell and taste like natural food. And so that piece of plastic can then be mistaken by a little fish for something that is actually good to eat. But of course it's not because it's not digestible. It's got all this organic pollutant load on it, which is taken up by the animal, and it can block the digestive tract. When a bigger fish eats the small fish, then these things accumulate much in the same way that mercury accumulates as you move up the food web in large tunas. So in the lower pictures here, those yellowish ones, uh, these are fibers. Remember those fabrics I was talking about uh, that come out in your washing machine? These are from a, a little fish called an Atlantic bumper. It eats zooplankton. Um, we collected it from Terrebon Bay, and its stomach was completely packed with fibers uh, of synthetic plastic. And every fish that we pulled out of Terrebon Bay that ate zooplankton, we didn't look at the other ones, had all these fibers jammed in their stomachs. So this stuff is getting into the environment. It's getting into small forage fish, and bigger fish like redfish eat them, and of course, then people who eat fish are potentially ingesting this load of, of organic pollutants that are inside the tissue of the fish. So I mentioned that we went out and we looked at uh, microplastics in the Gulf of Mexico. These are just numbers, uh, particles per cubic meter. Um, dark blue is one kind of a net. The light blue is a net that's right at the surface. And these are the numbers that we get. When we compare them to numbers from places like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch or other uh, gyres or inland seas where uh, circulation will concentrate plastics, we can see that we've got numbers that are as high or higher than uh, the hot spots that the media always talks about. Well, the question that arose was where are these plastics coming from? Because, I mean, the coast of Louisiana is not heavily populated. I can't imagine that these high densities are coming from people in Homa or Morgan City. And the reality is they're coming from the entire United States, or almost the entire United States. The Mississippi River drainage basin is home to over 100 million people. And there are cities just like Baton Rouge uh, that have the same problems that we have with trash. And all the lint, all the, the uh, paint flakes and other sources of plastic are coming down our river and moving out into the Gulf of Mexico. And we were sampling in the plume of the Mississippi River. So we designed a project, we got some funding from Sea Grant to take a look at microplastics in the Mississippi River. And so we set up five stations, three of them bracketed Baton Rouge, two of them bracketed New Orleans. Um, so we had one upstream of the old river bridge. Uh, we had one about in line with LSU and one just uh, below La Berge Casino. And then we had uh, one near the 310 bridge uh, near Norco and one down by um, uh, Bell Chase. And so we would go out to those quarterly and we'd tow a net in a small boat uh, across the river. We would do four transects across the river. Each one of them would yield a sample and we would count the plastics. We'd measure the volume of water that we collected. And uh, it was a real challenge because the lower Mississippi is not really a friendly place for a small boat. And, and so you don't see Boston whalers out there. And every time we were out there, you know, people would come up, do you need help? Is something wrong? No, we're, we're good. Uh, plus, you're trying to move in and out of the way of these large ships that are going up and down the river. So when we pulled our samples in, there's a typical sample. You can see there's a uh, bottle cap in there. There's some nurdles. There's lots and lots of plastic. And when you put, the, put it in a jar, all the little pieces of styrofoam come up to the surface. So we took our, our average numbers and we multiplied them by the flux, the flow rate of the river, and they, you get a plot like this. So this shows the daily microplastic flux between 0.5 millimeters, which was the smallest size we measured, and 5 millimeters, which was the largest size. Uh, and so we're up in, in the uh, billions of particles per day. And if you add that up and sum it over a year, 
you get a mean annual estimate of about 325 billion particles between 0.5 and 5 millimeters uh, being fluxed annually out of the river. And this is almost certainly a gross, gross underestimate because if we look at the abundance of our different sizes, those are just the midpoints of our three size categories. We had uh, 0.5 to 2 millimeters, 2 to 4 millimeters, 4 to 5 millimeters. You can see that the abundance goes up almost exponentially. So if we were to extrapolate down to the really, really small particles, we're certainly talking about trillions or hundreds of trillions of particles being fluxed into the Gulf of Mexico. We're, we are all probably aware of the uh, loss of land in Louisiana and the Coastal Master Plan, which involves diverting river from the Mississippi River into our coastal wetlands to allow sediments to rebuild land. That's the riverside intake uh, of the Davis Pond diversion, which was near one of our sampling sites. And it's an incredible mass of woody debris and plastic. And so we went out and sampled that area and uh, we put our net into the outfall of the Davis Pond diversion. The plot on the right just shows the flow rate during the, the time that we were there and the black areas are where we took samples. And the bottom is actually a movie. If you can play that, um, the bottom. We asked them to bump the flow rate up a little bit. And when they did that, the quantity of plastic that came rushing out of that outfall was staggering. Uh, and so it looks, you can see the wood, but there's tons of plastic coming out of there. Oops. And that's from one 15-minute sample. Uh, those are nurdles, fragments, uh, beads, all kinds of, of different plastics that we collected in a 15-minute sample. So remember those fish I showed you the stomach of from uh, Terrebonne Bay? I mean, we have to rebuild our coast, but we need to consider the consequences of having so much microplastic fluxing into the bays where we have nursery grounds for a lot of our fish. Uh, and if you do an estimate just based on that particular sample, uh, that would be the equivalent of 388, over 388 million particles per day being fluxed out of that one diversion. We've done some other things. Uh, the folks at LaBerge Casino were kind enough to let me turn their roof into kind of a little heli drone heliport. And so we flew a drone uh, almost several times a week uh, for several months over the river at low altitude, taking pictures of the surface. And uh, we were trying to map the plastic that was fluxing down the river, but it's a real challenge because the, uh, the drone has to be low enough to get a clear picture of the water, and there's a lot of foam in the river, and that foam looks a lot like plastic. So it became very difficult for us to distinguish uh, plastic from foam. So that, that didn't, science doesn't always work out the way you hope it's going to. But we did turn our drone into a, a different project, and so we uh, entered into a competition that the National Geographic Society had called the Ocean, Ocean Plastic Innovation Challenge. And we focused on the remote barrier islands along our coast and used the drone to map the plastic debris on those barrier islands. And so this is a small, a short video that I'll play for you. You can start the video that we submitted to uh, National Geographic. And this video, uh, we wound up being semi-finalists in this competition in the data visualization category.
semifinalists and we were in great company and we got to go to DC and present all this so it was really uh, an exciting opportunity but it's really depressing to go out to our remote islands where you really can only get to them by boat and see the litter from a hundred million people's worth of trash deposited on those islands and we could clean up that trash and I guarantee you could go back a week or two later and it, you wouldn't know the difference um, so we've got to do something to stop the plastic from fluxing into the river in the first place. Um, I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to end up with just a, a story of a recent spill. So about a year ago in uh, New Orleans, a ship called the Bianca broke loose from its moorings and lost some shipping containers. One of those 40-foot containers was filled with plastic nurdles, and those nurdles entered the river. And this was a substantial spill. So that's down by Governor Nichols Wharf just across from Café du Monde. And uh, so we went out with a team and we sampled uh, along the river down as far as Bell Chase. And uh, we were trying to estimate how much was out there. They, the shipping company lawyered up. They wouldn't tell us or anybody uh, how much was spilled. But in 2017, there was a spill of nurdles in Durban Harbor, South Africa. And the nurdles were packed in 25 kilogram sacks in a 40 foot shipping container. Well, th that's one of the sacks we recovered. They're 25 kilogram sacks. so we know that a shipping container can hold 990 of those. And so we estimated, uh, doing some simple math, about 750 million nurdles were spilt into the river. Uh, so where did they go? Well, the, this is high density polyethylene. It floats, so the majority of them probably entered the Gulf of Mexico very quickly. But large amounts were deposited along the shoreline between the Crescent City Connection Bridge and probably the mouth of the river. And so we went out with quadrat, we counted them, we cleaned and dried the samples, we had students sort all the wood and other debris out, and uh, we were, were in the process of putting together a paper on exactly how many nurdles were deposited. And you can see, just this is down at Chalmette Battlefield, this is, uh, you can see out over time, the, there was a fairly rapid decline as the river rose up and remobilized these nurdles, but they're still out there today. Uh, a colleague of mine went down there uh, a few weeks ago, and there are still nurdles from the spill on the shoreline. But what was really intriguing was the number of other nurdles we discovered. So we really discovered that, in fact, there's a paper we're going to write called A Nurdle in a Haystack uh, as a title, but we discovered that there's a chronic nurdle pollution problem in the lower Mississippi River uh, from all these other nurdles. We went down to Elmer's Island and found evidence of a massive nurdle spill. And while these nurdles matched spectrally the ones from our spill, their shape was completely different. So here was another spill of unknown origin that we documented down there. Uh, so that's very much a work in progress. Um, we, more recent work that we've done, and this involves Rotary, in April, the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative, uh, which is a group that involves all the mayors of our, uh, communities along the Mississippi, uh, they partnered with Rotary and uh, we d uh, had St. Louis, Baton Rouge, and St. Paul, Minnesota were selected as demonstration cities. And one of the things we did was release satellite tagged bottles, water bottles with a satellite GPS tracker in them. These were developed by Dr. Jenna Jambeck at the University of Georgia. And Jenna and I are working on a collaboration to expand this project. Well, one of those bottles made its way all the way from St. Louis to West Baton Rouge, where it was found by that gentleman when he was fishing. And so uh, we recovered it, recharged the battery, refurbished it, and he went out in the river uh, courtesy of Shamrock Marine. And we put it back in the river and sent it further down the river. Unfortunately, it got as far as Bruseley and got caught up in some barges, and that was the last we were able to hear from it. But we have plans to use more of this technology. So I'll wrap up by just saying that plastic is, is a, a ubiquitous sign of civilization. And I'm going to end with this uh, anecdote. When the folks who put together this zombie apocalypse series, Fear the Walking Dead, the set designers were asked how they transformed Los Angeles into this post-apocalyptic wasteland where people were gone. 
and they said we just picked up some of the trash. So I'll, I'll stop there with acknowledgments to these folks and I'll be happy to take any questions. When you were speaking, I walked out to get a cup of coffee and then Bob was still up. I noticed that instead of grabbing the cup, I grabbed, or grab, grab, grabbing a ceramic cup, I grabbed the styrofoam. So I sheepishly halfway into sitting down, I said, oh my God, the irony. Yeah. Yeah, so th those are both complex questions. I'll answer the first one, which is what, what can we do individually? I think there are a number of things, but we need to, to be conscious of the amount of plastic that we use. And so that means instead of uh, having styrofoam cups, you have ceramic cups, which can be cleaned, or buy yourself a water bottle uh, or a reusable cup. Um, take, take it opportunities to to minimize your interaction and use of plastics wherever they, th those opportunities afford themselves. So when you go to a coffee shop, take something that can be filled up. When you go to the supermarket, bring a bag where you can put uh, your groceries into it, your vegetables and fruits. I realized during COVID, a lot of grocery stores are resistant to the idea of people bringing in uh, reusable bags. So that, that's a challenge. Um, the other thing is there are simple things. You can put filters on your washing machines, which will collect the lint, and then you can dispose of the lint in the trash. Um, recycle where you can. Uh, and we have mixed recycling in Baton Rouge, which means we put everything into a bin. I've been to the MRF, the recycling facility, and they spend so much time taking things out of there that don't belong in there. We can really only recycle uh, polyethylene terephthalate and high-density polyethylene sometimes polystyrene. The other plastics need to go in the trash. They don't, they're not recyclable right now. In terms of technology, um, that's a real challenge. Um, there, there are vending machines. I know when I lived in Massachusetts, I could take my uh, soda bottles and plastic bottles and I could put them into a machine that read the barcode on them, identified the polymer, crushed them, and spit out a receipt that I could take and exchange for cash. Um, so we need to have a deposit, I believe, on uh, commonly used plastic items like water bottles. Um, we should have refilling stations on water fountains. You can see them at the Baton Rouge Airport, most airports now, most schools have them. So that's a simple technology to uh, avoid using water fountains uh, and, and encourage people to refill containers. Um, there are sophisticated trash booms in, in uh, Lafayette, on the, the river there, they have a device that skims all the plastic from the rivers and uh, collects it, puts it into a shipping container, and they empty that out and remove it. So uh, that, and then the final thing I would say is if you see a piece of trash on the ground, I don't imagine anyone here with litter, but if you see tra trash on the ground, pick it up. Because if you leave it there, it's gonna get fragmented and it's going to become a million little pieces of microplastic in the oceans. I guess a two-fold question. Um, the first part has to do with recycling. How efficient is recycling and how much of these you know, polystyrenes and things like this break down between when I put it in the recycling bin and it gets to its final destination? And I guess the second part of that question would be how quickly does plastic break down? And Because um, yeah. I've heard some plastic lasts for thousands of years. You talked about the differences. In right, right. So if you're putting polystyrene, in your recycling bin, uh, it's not gonna be recycled. It's not recyclable. Uh, again, only high density polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate, which are water bottles. And terms, yeah, so, but most of that plastic is sorted at the MRF here and is bundled, palletized, and sent off, and it's probably back on the shelves within one to two weeks as a new product. So it's ground up. So the ones that can be recycled, that's great. The other plastics, there used to be a market for them in China, but our recycling is quite dirty, and, and so the plastic was contaminated with food and other residues, and so they would not tend to take that plastic. And so that market is closed to us now, along with deteriorating, deteriorating relations with China. It just hasn't helped things. So a lot of plastic that used to be recycled is now not economically recyclable and goes into landfills. 
Um, the second part of your question was how long does plastic last? So it, you're correct, it can last from hundreds to thousands of years, uh, but it is going to go through this process of fragmentation. There's been some recent work by Chris Reddy at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution looking at uh, expanded polystyrene, so styrofoam, and they found that and, and under certain conditions it can break down quite rapidly in the order of a few years. But in general, most of these plastics are going to outlive you, your kids, and your grandchildren. So it's a long-term problem. I've got a question for you. Okay. There, the environmental group puts a lot of pressure on energy companies to go green and whatnot. Is there any concerted effort on the use of plastics and packaging by these national companies that sell goods and stuff like that? So, yeah, the question is, there, is there a, any effort to encourage uh, or re the re reduce the use of plastic packaging? There are lots of grassroots initiatives to encourage that. There are a lot of environmental organizations but it is extremely difficult and there's a lot of resistance to that. Um, it's, it's become somewhat politicized as well and some states, uh, local municipalities have passed laws against uh, moratoriums on plastic packaging and uh, restricting the use of uh, deposits or uh, in, uh, some sort of fee for a disposable plastic bag. Um, the other challenge is that plastic packaging, you know, in meats and uh, a lot of the stuff that you get in, in the grocery stores, um, our whole supply chain is designed to have that stuff shipped in that manner. And so having it shipped, you know, in bulk and uh, sold uh, without that packaging, it, it's, we're just not geared up for it. So uh, there are a lot of people who want to see it. The Europeans are ahead of us on this, uh, but we're not there yet, not even close. Yes, sir. Yeah, can you uh, explain to us some of the challenges with uh, cigarette butts and the pollutants that they, they have? Yeah, so cigarette butts, you see them everywhere, particularly intersections where there's, you know, a left turn that you're waiting for. Um, <laughs> and uh, everyone seems to think it's, it's okay. And they're small, and, you know, people don't even notice small plastic. Just anecdotally, you go to LSU after a football game and they clean up the big plastic, but all the little plastic's still out there and nobody notices it. So cigarette butts are made up of a matrix of plastic fibers that trap the tars and other organic residues from the burnt tobacco. And so over time, those things are going to be mechanically broken down along with the ultra effects of ultraviolet light. Cars are driving over them, and all those are contributing to these little microfibers. They're already coated with these organic pollutants, but then they can pick up other ones when they go down the river. Yeah, so cigarette butts, they're the number one item that have been found on beach cleanups around the world. It's uh, cigarette butts. <laughs> and I'll have to consult with you when we write our next paper. Uh, so nurdles are, are just the way, they're the most efficient way that raw plastic resin is made. So when Dow produced those nurdles, they, they took ethylene and put it in one of their plants and did some chemical jiggery pokery to it and converted it into uh, polyethylene. And they extruded it into these little pellets and those pellets they take up the, the least space they're easy to manipulate they're easy to transport they feed into hoppers and they are the raw material for all plastics you want to make a lego you start out with polystyrene nurdles you add colorant you add uh, plasticizer to it you put it in the mold and out pops a lego brick any plastic starts out as nurdles and they all start out like that one last one yes Thank you. But you bring up a question I think of frequently, which is, there's probably an aha moment every day. I know. There's probably an aha moment every day at a university somewhere in Louisiana of an undistinguishable factoid that the public would need to hear to change their behavior in a better way for all of us. Every day at the newspaper, there are at least five stories on LSU football. 
want to deal with the two of journalism. To start putting out articles on these things that you're discovering as part of your research. Because I've always felt like we as taxpayers put a lot of money into uh, universities. But it seems like some of the best things that we should get back for that investment, or it all stays behind the Ivy Tower. So again, you need to talk to the School of Journalism. Light a fire under them. That's, that's a great comment. We do work with uh, students, undergraduate students from the Manship School, and they, uh, they come to uh, my lab and they'll do an interview and write a story on it as part of their training to write stories as journalists. But maybe we need to get those stories out into the press. Thank you. Mark, thank you for speaking to us today.